The following program is classified G. It's suitable for all ages. We would like to remind our viewers that the views expressed in this program by our participating guests are solely viewpoints of them who take part and does not reflect the views and beliefs of the Verena Media Network. This is an opinion-based program. This is our Verena 24 tonight. Merely a week to go until we know as to who will take the helm and become our commander-in-chief. Tonight, we are going back to take a look at the sacrifices made by our soldiers in order to bring our country to this state. Can battlefield experience be translated into leading a nation? Two candidates this time do have a military background and both are hoping that you will provide them your support to reach the top. As the fight for the presidency heats up, every party is pushing their agendas, hoping that their version of Sri Lanka would resonate with you the best to garner your vote. But when it comes to national security, who has the best plans? Who will be able to keep this country safe? And who will be the best fit to lead this nation as our commander-in-chief? To discuss the country's way forward in terms of national security tonight, I'm joined by Major General Sumedha Pereira, who was instrumental in many successful operations and was the former Deputy Chief of Staff at the Sri Lanka Army. Welcome to Monday. It's time to get real. A happy Monday evening to all. Good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for joining me this week as well. We just need to wait about five to six days to know who will be our next Commander-in-Chief. Tonight, we want to discuss as to whether our country's way forward should be prioritized on the importance of national security, as everything else would succeed if we get this right. Let's discuss. In my opening statement this evening, by now it is very clear to you as to who has the best vision to lead this nation. I'm sure you would have gone through the manifestos, at least from the ones who did release one, and would have been able to ascertain for yourself as to the best path this nation should lead to. What we really need right now is a leader who can provide the necessary means of a vision towards the potential success of this country. We really need to reject free handouts. Giving this amount of things to that amount of things doesn't work. It only makes us lazy and more so slow down our determination to succeed. One thing we need to continue to keep in mind is the importance of national security and how it will play out after the November 16th elections. National security, in my opinion, is the most important element that we need to consider. This is mainly because everything else is connected to the success of it. For an example, after the April 21st attacks, you saw how the economy, development, education and our way of life took a hard hit because our national security failed. We cannot be a nation that forgets the sacrifices made by our soldiers in order to get us here. So if they can sacrifice their lives, something that you and I chose not to do because we were not courageous enough to take on that responsibility, then it is our solemn duty to at least use our vote to a candidate that would in return secure this nation. <laughs> ಮಗೆಯಾಂಡುಲಾ <laughs> ಮಗೆ 
Okay, everyone, let's now move on to the discussion portion of our program. And tonight, we want to talk more about national security and also get an understanding as to the sacrifices we as a nation and more so the sacrifices made by our soldiers in order to get us here. Now, tonight, I'm joined by Major General Sumedha Pereira. Now, Major General Sumedha Pereira has been serving in the Sri Lanka military for over 37 years. He has been very much instrumental in the successful operations such as uh, Trividha Bala and the Wadamarachi operations way back uh, in the 1980s, which, will, which led to the Gajaba Regiment uh, in securing Jaffna and the Jaffna Fort. Uh, he was also the former Deputy Chief of Staff at the Sri Lanka Army. Now, he has an ab absolute illustrious career in serving this nation and tonight I'm telling you I am very much honored to be in his presence. Welcome sir to the program. Um, sir I want to start off uh, with regard to the current status of our military here in Sri Lanka. Um, we've seen uh, the military being in a very strong and commanding position in 2009 when we won the war and uh, then we see a slow demise, uh, it, not in terms of their ability to serve, but more also the, the, the space that they had uh, in the political spectrum, in, in, in the public spectrum. Seems for me personally that people are slowly forgetting about what really happened in 2009 and beyond and the sacrifice that our military made uh, up until that time. We saw um, about a month back some of our veterans going onto the streets asking for basic demands, which I, I, I personally believe is deplorable, uh, should not have happened. What do you think where we are at this moment? Namash, thank you very much for having me in this program. Now, uh, as you said, I have a 37 years of uh, service in the Army. I, when I, left, I had almost completed 37. So I joined the Army way back in uh, 90, actually it was in 1980, and uh, it was a very small army then, and the terrorism in Sri Lanka was just uh, starting, and uh, terrorist activities were just emerging in North and East, and uh, so that's the time that uh, we were commissioned to the army as second lieutenant. So being an infantry officer from Gajabar Regiment, uh, I was always in the field commanding uh, troops uh, in the battlefield and uh, we have seen so many changes that has taken place uh, during this period until we uh, concluded this war in 2009. Uh, of course, uh, as you said, uh, soldiers are remembered much uh, uh, when there's a problem, when, 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 when there's a requirement in the country. So other times uh, they are very conveniently forgotten. That is one aspect. Uh, but the, the, the fact is, uh, we cannot uh, have that situation here in Sri Lanka because uh, so much of lives have been lost. So much of sacrifices have been made by our valiant soldiers. Now, I joined the army uh, at the age of 18 because I must tell you the truth, I want to do a job mm. uh, after my A-levels. So I didn't, never wanted to serve the country. I never served, wanted to serve my motherland. I liked the uniform because I did cadet in school. Mm. I liked the uniform, I joined. So everybody uh, is like that, most of them. So, but when you join the service, you know, after some time, you find that with that training that you get, with that motivation that you get, and it becomes something beyond a job. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is like protecting the country and without knowing that you get to that state. So you are not merely working for 30, 40,000 rupees. No, it becomes a service. So uh, actually, as you said, we got to remember them. We got to look after our soldiers to the best of our ability. Uh, I know that it has not taken place, but we should have, we must have all uh, our resources directed towards that because uh, they have made so many sacrifices. 
Indeed, uh, let's uh, discuss about what changes uh, needs to be taken um, with regard to foreign affairs and also uh, with regard to our military um, way down uh, into the program. But I want to start off, uh, you said uh, you joined the army in 1980. Um, frankly, I was not even born. Um, and uh, at that stage, which means from 1980 onwards, you have, you literally has witnessed how our country transformed from a peaceful state towards a w war uh, state. Um, during that entire process, we've been going through so much of issues. Please take us through uh, what happened in the 1980s, what, what led to the, the, the war that actually um, killed so much, so much of people, not only, not only from our side, from both sides. Uh, innocent lives were lost. And uh, just take us through that. Yeah, Mahesh, let me uh, run through this uh, whole thing since 1980. I think uh, that will help to refresh uh, the minds of your viewers. Now, when we joined in 1980, actually, uh, the terrorism was just starting. And uh, the LTT was uh, not there. There was a group called PLOT. And it was led by uh, Umar Mahesh Sharan. That was the most dominant group uh, during that time. So as usual, as any terrorist group, they started collecting uh, money. Mm -hmm. They started uh, robbing banks and uh, collecting funds to, to take their organization to the next level. Uh, then uh, I think uh, uh, in 1979, uh, a team of CID officers go to Jaffna and, uh, and they get killed. The, the, uh, the terrorists kill them, ambush and that's the first killing that was reported at that time. Uh, then, of course, uh, 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 one of our soldiers was killed during an election, early, uh, early 80s. And of course, uh, then Prabhakaran emerged as one of the most prominent leaders. And uh, I think he forms LTT, and he made sure that all the other groups are all destroyed, and he takes the most prominent place in uh, Jaffna Peninsula. After that, he himself uh, goes and kills Mr. Doreyappa, the mayor. And then, of course, the, the 1983 incident where uh, 13 soldiers, including Lieutenant Vas Gunawardana, again my batchmate my, and my roommate uh, during cadet time, uh, they were all killed during an ambush in Tirunaveli. So that sparked the communal violence elsewhere. And uh, even as young officers, uh, we saw that it's a very unfortunate incident, but I should say that. Uh, uh, the government, uh, government who was in power at that time, they did not take sufficient action to uh, control it. Uh, I can remember our battalion was in Diyatalava, and the day that they were uh, destroying properties in Bandarela, we were doing a parade. And next day only, they tasked us to go and deploy. And my, myself, I took about 50 soldiers uh, to Valimada uh, to station there, and I could not get through Bandarela, and it was all, you know, on fire. So, so that this gave, was back in this was in 83, famous uh, July uh -huh. uh, riots. riots. And uh, actually, why I say that this, is, this was a very important junction, juncture, uh, till then the LTT, uh, though it was a very dominant uh, group, they could not find mm -hmm. enough recruits. Nobody was willing to join this movement because generally Jaffna uh, youths were, they were like, they were wanted to concentrate on their education. The others uh, were getting involved in agriculture. They were generally a peace-loving people. But uh, what happened in this part of the world, when innocent civilians, Tamils, were attacked, and that allowed the LTTE to motivate the youths in Jaffna. Mm -hmm. And after that, when we went to Jaffna, certain principals have told me personally, their schools, their classrooms itself had vacated then, gone and joined LTT. So LTT got a really a good uh, boost, uh, a very good dose of ex mm -hmm. oxygen uh, because of that. Then 93, uh, it's, it's, then, then with that strength, they start dominating the Northern Peninsula. They capture areas and uh, we get confined to barracks. In fact, uh, uh, they start controlling everything. Uh, then that's the time uh, that uh, the first operation in the Sri Lankan history, conventional type of operation, Operation Vadamarachi, or you call it liberation, uh, we plan in uh, Jaffna. So actually, if you take Jaffna, Mahesh, Jaffna is in three parts. Mm -hmm. 
that is the northernmost parties uh, called Badamarachi, that consist of Madagal, KKs, Tondamanaru, Valdeturi, and Point Pedu. Mm -hmm. Then you have the central part, that's where the Jaffna town is, right? right? That is called Valikamam. Then the southern part, that is Elephant Pass, okay. Pale and Chavakacheri is uh, the Tendamarachi. So the idea of the operation was to capture Vadamarachi. So during this time, if I may interrupt you, um, Kilinochi, uh, Vaunia, um, Mulathiu, those are all free areas. No, actually that? we had few bases, like uh, uh, during this period, we had the Point Pedro camp. Valvaturi uh, camp we had, but uh, all were surrounded by LTT. Our, 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 our uh, movements were very much restricted to the camps. And Palali base was there, including Air Force Base, and the Elephant Pass garrison was there. That was all that we had. But our, but our freedom of movement was, uh, it had been uh, restricted to a very, very great extent. So, in the light of this, that we planned this operation, is commanded by famous General General Dosin Kobbakadu, mm. General Vijay Malaratna, and uh, we uh, start our advance from Tondamanaru and within one month we capture the whole of Vadamarachi, that including the Prabhakaran's uh, uh, stronghold Valladituri. You must have heard about yes. Canada, Banka and all kind of thing. So this irritates the Indian government. So next day they send boats loaded with uh, Russians to Sri Lanka and our navy intercept and they were forced back to they were forced to go back. And next day, they sent, uh, they violated our airspace, they sent A32 planes loaded with Russians and escorted by Mirage 2000 aircrafts. And we were all helpless. We were looking up and waiting. So that is how Indian uh, reacted to this. And as a result, the, uh, President Jawadan had no option but to abandon the next two phases of Vadamaraji. So then comes the, uh, immediately followed by that, uh, with the uh, um, felicitation of, uh, facilitation of India, Rajiv Gandhi. Now we yes. signed the peace accord, famous peace accord, Prabhakaran and the UMP government. And they send the Indian peacekeeping force to Sri Lanka to observe the handing over of weapons and ammunition to the Sri Lankan forces. So it happens only a little bit of weapons and ammunition have been handed over. Then they start offensive operations against <coughs> IPKF. And IPKF, in the hands of uh, LTT, they suffer huge casualties because one thing is they were not geared to fight a guerrilla war. Mm. It was a, it's purely a conventional army. And they, they were very new to the terrain. They, 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 so at, at the, initially, hundreds of them died. So how they overcome this is they bring it's a massive army of 1.2 million. So they bring divisions and divisions and establish camps and roadblocks all over North and East. And that actually helped them to get the edge. Then LTT movements again get restricted. And it was like by that time, the IPK had sacrificed 1,200 people. And they had spent about more than 12 billion uh, Indian rupees and about another uh, hundreds of them have got injured. So a lot of sacrifices had been made by IPK at that time. So with that, the election comes, President Jawadana to President Premadasa. And according to a pledge given by uh, President Premadasa, he forced the IPK to go back to India. And uh, he does not stop at that. He gives weapons and ammunition to IP, uh, LTT through the army to, to attack IPK-5. That was a very unfortunate incident. Uh, it was a real betrayal, I should say. And uh, betrayal IPKF, of our relations with relationship India. with India, and we wouldn't have done that. We would have asked IPK if it, it uh, because I, I can remember those days they were uh, like uh, 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 they were identifying IPK as an invasion army. So we could have just allowed them to go, but given the enemy, uh, our enemy, to uh, 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 attack people who came to help us was not uh, a proper thing to do. So anyway, uh, then as usual, LTT, when IPK left, the, they yeah. turned their guns towards us. Now, once that happened, we were also not 
our army was small and we were confined to barracks. But uh, we had not done operations, our troops, for years, right? And uh, some of the troops had got involved in the JVP, uh, uh, controlling JVP movements in southern parts. So we also faced enormous problems, but somehow uh, we managed to uh, uh, stabilize the situation. And then uh, we see uh, successive governments coming in uh, up until 2005, up until the time where uh, President, uh, former President Mahindra Rajapaksa uh, took over as president of this country. Uh, we've seen, I mean, we remember um, the 8 o'clock news was always the first two, three stories is about our operations in the north. And we uh, heard that we apparently advanced this much, we uh, advanced that month, we suffered this much of casualties. Uh, that kind of reports was a constant daily thing uh, in, in the southern part of, uh, of our country. Um, just take us a little bit, refresh our, 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 the minds of our viewers as to what was the, we saw a height of a war from, from uh, I think around 1995 up until 2004, 2003. Um, if you can take us through that, that particular period. Yeah, Mahesh, actually, uh, as I told you, when IPK left, IPK force left Sri Lanka, when LTT was uh, all out to attack us, the situation became very critical. Uh, they wanted to, uh, to take control of Trincomalee because of the mm. harbour. And uh, by that time, they had taken the full control of Jaffna Peninsula except for a few camps that we had. And uh, as you can remember, uh, Mutur, to cripple the harbour, uh, they sent a force to capture Sampur and uh, Sampur, Ilankante, Kinya and Mutur. So when you capture that area, Nobody can enter the harbour mm. because they could easily destroy them by way of sending suicide boats and using heavy guns. So there was a getaway point called uh, 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 there's a uh, bridge close by Mutur, uh, Katta Parishan, and that's a, a very important place because all the troops had to go across that. So L IPK was holding this uh, base. Uh, Kattaparichan very strongly, but at the final stage they got destroyed and about 40 to 45 IPK guys uh, go missing. They could not even find bodies, so LTT was holding that. So the, after having captured all these areas, that this is in 1987, after IPK have left, uh, the LTT surround the Mutur camp, only camp that we had, and the camp, the, the fall of uh, Mutur camp becomes imminent. So that's the time the army sent 30 commandos led by one of the very good officers called Lieutenant Rashad to reinforce and rescue Mutur. But quite unfortunately, when they landed by boat in Ilankante, the message goes to the LTT and they ambush them and kill all 30. And uh, that's the time that our battalion was called upon to, to uh, mm -hmm. take this task. And at that time, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Gota Bey Rajapaksa, he the commanding officer of the battalion. I was the 2IC. And operation commander, General Densil Kobekadu. And he tasked us to go and save Muthur and the surrounding areas and uh, to start Trincomalee Harbor operation. So actually, we set off from uh, Seruvilla. And we go across the jungle, 35 kilometers, right? across jungle and destroy all enemy pockets on the way and finally we attack the Kattaparichan base and capture that, then clear the whole area and bring reinforcement to Muthur and come back. So that was the first operation that uh, I, uh, that Ilambo first operation that was led by Lieutenant Colonel uh, Gotabe Rajapaksa. So as we came to Trincomalee, then we find the, the civilians in especially uh, Mutur, Valley, uh, all the villages get attacked. Muslim villages, Sinhala villages, they come and brutally kill them to scare them away to uh, further south. Uh, and uh, they carry out attacks on uh, army vehicles, ambush a small group of soldiers. So situation again become critical. Then General Danak Perra, you must have heard yes. of, he was a colonel, and he gets appointed as the uh, brigade commander and two battalions, that is 1GIA, 1st Battalion, the Gajabar Regiment, my battalion, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Gota Bey Rajapaksa, and 4th Battalion, the Gajabar Regiment, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Gamini Gunasekara. We were grouped as a brigade 
and we were tasked to destroy the, the base in Trincomalee. So Trincomalee, the main base of LTT is called Baskaran base. It is a big one. And this was located uh, uh, west of Nila Valley. So we planned the operation, these two officers together with General Janaka Pereira. Again, we do a night march to achieve surprise. And by early morning, we go and surround the camp. And that time, as the LTT was preparing their breakfast, they were making roti. And we surround the camp from three sides and allow another area for them to get away. And we lay ambushes. Our people lay in ambushes to kill them. So by 5.30 with the first light, we spring the attack uh, ambushes. And uh, we manage to kill more than 20, 22 uh, terrorists then and there. And so many get wounded. And there was uh, uh, there are about more than 12 satellite camps around this main base. They all get interfered with us, but we managed to destroy them. And uh, there were more than, as I can remember, 12 to 15 vehicles, ammunition dumps, weapons, Russian dumps, all of them. Actually, they were operating from there. They used to go across Tiria. They used to go across Maradanka Devala and attack the military targets and the civilian targets. So with that attack, the situation becomes normal. So uh, then as he came to the base, and uh, even left in Kota he didn't have even time to get his troops organized, uh, we get orders to go to Jaffna, north, because by that time, uh, LTT mm -hmm. troops in Jaffna, they go and take over Jaffna, including the civilian population. And all our people get uh, to uh, Jaffna Fort and they go under siege. Uh, that was the situation. So then we were ordered to go to Jaffna, and that is where uh, I will, a little later, I will explain how we did it. And we planned an operation called Trivida Balay together with the 1SR Regiment, 1st Battalion, the Singha Regiment, led by uh, Lieutenant Colonel Sarat Fonseca and Manjia led by Lieutenant Colonel Gota Abhi Rajapaksa. We uh, do a proper super operation and go and rescue the Jaffna Vote people. Indeed, uh, General, w one thing that we've heard, and I want, want you to uh, tell us what exactly happened, uh, the political willingness uh, within the past presidents who came into power um, was not exactly there in ending the war. Uh, it was more or less managing the war up until 2005, uh, up until uh, former President Mahindra Rajapaksa took uh, power. There was a story where we said we were almost a uh, few miles away in capturing the, 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 literally finishing the war and capturing Prabhakar and, and ending it. And uh, I think it was former President uh, Chandrika Kumarathunga was under her leadership. It was stopped. Can you just confirm, were they, was that true or was that just a simple rumor? Yes, Mahesh. Now, uh, you must be knowing the, the famous Rivera's operation, uh, where we, uh, the one we uh, launched to capture Jaffna. So after capturing Jaffna, this was during President Chandrika Bandar Nayak Kumarathunga's time. And uh, secretary was uh, Minister, uh, uh, secretary was Mr. Anurudh Ratwate, or minister, honorable minister was Mr. Anurudh Ratwate. So after we captured uh, Jaffna Peninsula, Riviresa, Jaffna Peninsula, it's a successful operation, I must tell you. We come right up to Kilinochi and we liberate all the areas. And as a result, the LTT, they take the civilians and they go to Mulatu jungles and they become strong there. So from there, they start attacking camps like Pune or in Mulati. So the government, again, uh, after completing the Rivera's operation very successfully, they are thinking of opening the A9 road from Vaunia to maintain the supply line. That is how this Jayasikuru operation comes into being. So three divisions take part in this operation. And they all start from Vaunia. And you know, first uh, few months, they face heavy resistance, but they managed to go up to Maan Kulam, Pulian Kulam line, right? So, as you said, we were at the doorstep of 1-4 base or the Prabhakaran's base. 
then you know mahesh when we uh, unlike those guerrilla outfits when we conduct operations we take a fairly big uh, size uh, 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 this uh, formation we maintain and a lot of people take part in that so there is a requirement to maintain the supply line mainly to evacuate casualties and to get our supplies or the food stuff up and also we have to secure our flanks because it's not a conventional setting where you know the enemy line and you go and fight and push back the enemy they are a mobile terrorist group so they can appear from anywhere and infiltrate into our area so we make sure that our whilst the advance is taking place our flanks are guarded so you need troops to do that so when we went to mankulam and puliyankulam line when we were just about to launch the second wave we realized that we don't have sufficient troops to maintain the flanks and the secure the rear so that's the time we request honorable minister to do go for immediate recruitment and get us some people at least volunteer people so later on i got to know later on after a couple of years see when we met him at a different this thing he told me when we asked why what happened he said no i knew the requirement and i when i went and asked president kumar tunga she said why do you want 40000 troops or 30000 uh, it's too dangerous to expand the army second thing what are you going to do after the war you expand the army what are you going to do with them so you manage with what you have so how he managed was the situation was he brought air force and navy people from elsewhere now they were not geared to fight a ground battle and we used them to put flanks and there was a navy outfit that was deployed in otiamale a place called near to padavia and a small group of ltt they attacked and quite unfortunately these navy people they were not prepared to fight bunker war they were on a, on a different role altogether and they pushed back and that group of ltts came inside the uh, controlled area the front troops got to know that there had been an infiltration they don't know that a small group and everything fell like a pack of cards and that all that effort money weapons ammunition and those sacrifices everything went haywire and our troops were back in vaunia within no time leaving tanks artillery weapon and lot of items so same thing could have happened this time right our when we started i think our army was 40 45000 mm. but i had to give due credit to the the rajapaksa uh, government because they expanded it to be about 180 navy air force so that was a very salient uh, aspect of the whole thing indeed uh, general i want to talk about uh after 2005 how exactly did we progress and i also want to talk about the leadership of gotabe rajpaksa who who actually played a pivotal role in ending this uh, war along with his fellow uh, military soldiers uh, and he's now standing to lead our nation um, hopefully um, in two weeks time in about a week and a half time we will get to know exactly whether he was successful or not but before that i really want to take a short commercial break i will be right back i'm in conversation with um, major general smith parada this is the first time to the program i'm in conversation uh, with major general sumedh pereira uh, who has been um, serving over 37 years in the military um, and has an extensive knowledge with regard to how uh, the current individual gota bay rajpaksa who is standing for presidency who wants to now lead this nation to the future has operated you've seen it up close and personal um working with him uh, in the military i'm going to be very frank and ask you this question uh, very bluntly do you think he has the ability to lead this nation yes definitely mahesh and let me uh, explain you a bit why uh, because one reason is i have seen him 
performing in the field. And I am an officer who was with him for 13 or more than 13 years continuously in the field. Uh, when he went to America in 1986 to follow the advanced infantry court, a course in um, uh, Fort Benning, and upon his return, he get appointed at the command unit. And uh, since then, I have seen him, the way that he, he, he commanded his troops. And I must tell you, uh, and he uh, then, uh, he was one of the best, well-respected commander, uh, uh, infantry battalion commander at that time. And that is why, uh, as I explained a little while ago, after this Baskaran base, after this uh, Mutur base, he was called upon to, 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 to break the siege in Jaffna, our battalion, together with one Nissa. So, 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 even in that battle, uh, there were a lot of uh, decisive uh, moments, and uh, the decision has to be taken very quickly. Things are changing very fast, because you are going to break a siege of a camp surrounded by LTT from all sides. So I should say, tell that he, together with uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Sarat Fonseca, who was the commander of SESA mm -hmm. and also the General Densil Kobekadu, they did a splendid job and we learned a lot from them, right? Then, uh, so that is one thing. And I, one of the most important aspect that I have seen him is that he is very good at picking people, right person to the right task. Uh, it has been happening even uh, those days. Uh, and also, he had the habit of monitoring. Uh, I can remember when you go to different, different places, sometime when we capture area, we used to defend. So actually, the, the company commander, so the, uh, the present uh, army commander, Shavendra Silva, mm -hmm. uh, then Shanta Disanayak, uh, Ranjan Lama Heva, all those officers, uh, uh, the company commanders, I was the second in command. So some, most of the time, when we go and harbor in a place, I used to get a call from Shavind or this. They used to ask me in single, Sir, Miss Yo, I bet that you are buried there. And I asked why. So I said, I don't want to go to the hospital. I asked why. I said, I don't want to go to the hospital. I said, I don't want to go to the hospital. And I said, I don't want to go to the hospital. See, don't send the CEO. He's creeping everywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are not even cleared those areas. So, so I think the, that habit continued. <laughs> And uh, so, so he had that uh, ability to pick people, the right people to do the right thing. And he, he, he was not a person who will just give orders and get to a side and wait. He, he will monitor. He makes sure that uh, things happen. That is uh, one of the things that I really wanted to ask you. Now, apparently, according to the opposition to Mr. Gutabe Rajapaksa, what their claim is, he was more or less sitting in Colombo in an AC room, just uh, doing, you know, becoming, being the secretary uh, of, of a defense ministry. But you have seen him in action in the field, so this is this is not a person who's just uh, got experience in in in, a, in an office room, but more or less has been right in front of the battle lines and actually experienced uh, the 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 the, uh, the entire fight. I, uh, if if you may have anything to say on that. Yes, I don't agree with that uh, because the same uh, line of uh, command. Uh, maybe in a different scenario, because he was the secretary of uh, UDA, and uh, of course uh, he was running the war machine. Uh, I don't agree with that. I think uh, if if I may go back, uh, if I if I really uh, give my opinion, uh, even this uh, conflict, the humanitarian operation, I think he played a very very big role, because. He get appointed as the Secretary of Defense. The first advantage, advantage that he enjoys is all the field commanders, including the junior officers, he knew them personally. Mm -hmm. And he had a superb knowledge of the ground, north and east. And the most important point, he was the brother of the sure. president. Uh, if I give you an example, like one, uh, at one stage, I was the military spokesman. Uh, for the Minister of Defence and also direct me. Those days, there's only one hmm. spokesman, unlike these days. So, Secretary of Defence was uh, uh, former IG, Mr. Cyril Herat. So, I used to go very often 
to meet him for instructions and that kind of things. So I can remember at that time, one of our camps in Northern side, uh, they, 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 they go under heavy attack and we suffer a, a lot of casualties. About 20 to 25 die and about a lot of them get injured. So I get the message as the military spokesman. So I write it on a paper. I go to meet the second defense. But I know that this message has been delivered already by the commander of the army. So as I can remember, I go inside the office. So I mean, he, he is a very honorable gentleman. He's not a military man altogether. Mm. So I, I, don't, I, I feel that he didn't understand the gravity of the situation much also. Uh, he told Sumedha, something has happened there. I know 40 died. Yes, I said, yes, sir. In fact, I have the report. With that, a telephone call comes. Uh, he picked up the phone and he tells me, Echi, Echi. Then I knew that it was none other than <laughs> the, Mr. Chand uh, His Excellency, President Chandrika Mandana Kumar Tunga. So now the co telephone conversation goes on and his face changes, you know. So I know that something seriously is happening, that I know that he is getting blackguarded by the president for having, you know, this much of casualties. So ex precisely as I said, he keeps the phone and said, she's really mad. She, she's scolding me like hell. I, I also don't know what these commanders are doing. They must be more careful. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I said, sir, when you fight was, you know, these things happen. You, I mean, the, this is inevitable, right? But of course, you have to find why it happened. But I know that orders are sent to commanders to be careful, not to take risk of that nature, to minimize casualties. It's good to send, but by doing that, you are killing their initiative, right? I think this time, this should have happened definitely, because initial stages of the uh, humanitarian operation, we are not walking on a bed of roses. Especially Madhu area, people are getting killed, camps are getting attacked, casualties, a lot of problems. So definitely, President Mahindra Rajapaksa would have asked his brother, Gota Bay, what are you doing? Here, the body bags are coming, man. you are not advancing. You have asked. I mean, naturally, he's a civilian. But Gota Bay would have told, I, yeah, don't worry. I'll see that it is done. These things happen. I, I think that would have happened because then that pressure never came down to the ground commanders. The blood is thicker than water, right? Do you think that combination helped? in winning the war, uh, having a trusted person for the president of this country to bank on uh, and to rely on and to ensure that he would actually do 100% to uh, safeguard this country. Do you think that particular combination, the brother combination helped? Yeah, that worked very well, especially in this part of the world. Uh, everything is politized, right? Uh, everything is politized because uh, to get everything done, to do everything, you need to have the blessings of the politician. I know that certain people have told that, uh, you know, increase in the army was done by somebody and it's not the political. No. We, army commander or, or, or somebody cannot even recruit a waiter or a cook out of the card. So it, it, those are purely political uh, decisions. To spend money, millions of dollars, to bring uh, ammunition is a political decision. Then rally round people of the country to give away their sons and daughters to fight the war. So politicians play a big role. So on the other side, Secretary of Defense, being a military man, knowing what is happening on both sides, he nicely combined, he, he coordinated everything. And on top of that, we had the best commanders he had picked by that time. To, to lead forces, the best guy, best commanders, I should say. And they were given all the training, all the exposures, everything that was possible. So that was a successful story. So I should say it's the political leadership and the coordination of Second Defense, being the brother of the president, and fully trained, well-picked, well-selected, well-trained military. You know, you have experienced uh, the vision of Gotabe Rajpaksa, um, how he wants his military to be, how he wants his military to carry out operations, and what kind of um, commitment that they have to put to in order to get the results. And you've seen that it, it has always been result-oriented. So now he's moving away from the military, and now he's, he's 
standing to become the leader of this nation. It's a civilian job, uh, a civilian job uh, that needs more than what he was doing within the military to try to understand the people, try to understand their needs. It's, it's not simply just a single operation, but it is more so of uh, ensuring that the economy is you know, so prosperous, our development goes beyond. Do you think he has the capacity to handle that? Yeah, I feel, anyway, yet to be tested, I should say. But I feel with all the, the, uh, all the information and all the knowledge that I have about him, that he will be a better ruler of this country. Because though you command uh, soldiers, right, uh, on battlefield, uh, there are so many administrative things to be done. Actually, you need to look after your soldiers much more than their wives and uh, parents. Otherwise, they don't come with you to give away their lives. So, 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 so actually, we have the best administrators, best logisticians mm -hmm. in services. So I don't think he lack in that experience. And when I looked at the, uh, the performance that he had in these two institutions, so leave aside the Secretary, Ministry of Defense, but uh, Urban Development Authority, right? In detail planning. And he always had a vision. He, he, he is not a person who will do things because, you know, something has to be done. No. He will always plan well, right? He will work to a plan. So that was clearly shown, I think, uh, uh, during his uh, tenure at UDA. And when you compare with... Uh, the people, other ministers, his counterparts. Uh, he was just a secretary of a ministry. Mm. But uh, when I c compare with the ministers and people with more power and authority, I think if he's given the authority, he'll be a better ruler, he'll be a good administrator, he'll be a good uh, logistician. Before we go to a commercial break, I want, to, I want you to be a bit ob objective. 35 candidates are vying to become the president, the, the, the head of state, the, the commander-in-chief of, of this country. I'm sure you would have gone through all 35. I think more than 30 does not even have put out an agenda. Most of them are contesting for fun, if I may say this. But you've seen the main two candidates, uh, the, the, the candidate from the New Democratic Front, uh, Sajid Premadas, and also... Um, from the Sri Lanka Pudu Jana Peramunagota Abhay Raj Paksa, who, who, been, who we've been talking about. When you compare their vision for this country with regard to national security, who stands with credible credibility that they can actually deliver it and make sure that uh, what they say can be done, not in a superficial manner, but in an absolute uh, practical manner? Yes, Mahesh. Actually, I look at it uh, in this way. Uh, now, during uh, the President Premadasa's time, uh, President uh, uh, Mahinda Rajapaksa's time, so Gotabe Rajapaksa was the Secretary of Defense. And uh, even during the war, we had enormous pressure from uh, outside. Right? But they withstood. Right? They never... Uh, let the troops down, and neither they stopped the operation. They, they had the will to uh, continue. So when it was over in 2009, I should say, they, they, they looked after the forces also well, to the best of their ability. And uh, when the accusations came, uh, they, they, they confronted, and they, they always wanted to look after the forces. But, but with the change of government, Mahindra Rajapaksa government to uh, the UMP government, we have seen so many changes. I think the worst part was taking this military matters, national security, to the political platform. And it became a disaster. No other country, the rulers or the politicians discuss their national policies, their security matters in political platform. Even otherwise, they all, they all work on need-to-know basis. So that was the first thing. And in the rush, we were giving mixed signals, and the international community picked up. Now we are at the receiving end. So what I say is, the other candidate, 
Mr. Uh, Sajid Premadas, he was a very prominent minister of this government. Mm. So now he could have, if he was so uh, uh, aware of it, or for what is happening, he doesn't have to give future promises. He would have corrected these things uh, then and there. Even now it's not too late. But the other candidate, during his tenure, together with his brother, they, they proved. So I think when you compare both, I think uh, Gotabe Rajapaksa will be a better candidate. Talking purely on the platform of national security, uh, uh, what you raised was the fact that uh, national intelligence and, and the state affairs were made very politicized in, and brought into political platform to discuss. But I want to point out what uh, statement made by a former army commander who is now standing for the same seat of president, um, General Mahesh Senanayake, who claimed to say that apparently he cannot agree with the fact that uh, because they were discussed or because they were taken into you know certain uh, into custody and taken into, um, uh, into put into jail, that it did not affect national security. Being a very senior military man, how do you respond to that? Mahesh, I don't agree with that statement. Because uh, uh, one of the most important uh, component of a country and a force is the intelligence. Now, way back in 1980s, when we had this problem, we never had intelligence. That is why this war was, th this dragged on for 30 years. Then we realized the importance of having intelligence agencies and we started developing. And at the end of the, uh, this thing, and uh, when it came to 2007-8, we had a superb network of intelligence uh, people. We had more than 13 to 14 battalion. Only they were doing military and intelligence, the field intelligence. So that was the level. That is why we were able to uh, send our LRRPs and uh, take targets uh, behind enemy lines. That is why we uh, managed to uh, capture terrorists in uh, other areas. That is why we could work with uh, international uh, communities and apprehend people uh, in other countries. So this was all there. But now the problem is, okay, as I said, few people may, you know, in any organization you have bad eggs, right? You have black sheep. That's, that's no problem. That's, that's the normal thing. But uh, because of those few people, you can't destroy an institution. It's very unfair. This is what happened. Even uh, uh, Millennium, mm -hmm. that trade, even what happened uh, now, if they have done something wrong, they would have been taken to task separately. In fact, this was told to His Excellency the President. Uh, soon after he got appointed by a few of us. We, were, we had a meeting in Nigambu. Uh, at, that is the time they started arresting these people, the police. So we told the President, sir, don't allow this to happen. Military intelligence people should not be tried in public because that is detrimental to the organization. Take them away. Have a separate body to investigate into this. Uh, this. It is not happening in Ro. It's not happening in Mossad. Have you ever heard uh, uh, CIA operatives have been, uh, you know, tried in public? No. The reason is not to safeguard their sins, but to safeguard the organization that they serve. So, so that did not happen. They are again politically politicized. They were attached to political. Uh, killings, political kidnapping. So it was a very unfortunate incident. Indeed, uh, Major General Sumedha Pereira, uh, I want to talk about uh, when we come back with regard to uh, veteran affairs of this country. I um, want to get a response uh, to the protest and, and uh, the deplorable situation where our soldiers was forced to go onto the streets just to ask for their, uh, to demand certain privileges that they actually require. We'll talk about that uh, right after this uh, short commercial break. You're watching Get Real Estate. Welcome back, everyone. 
on to the program. I'm in conversation with Major General Sunil Pereira. With regard to the security situation uh, that we saw in the past and exactly how national security will play out as we move uh, beyond the presidential election. I want to talk to you, uh, General, with regard to what happened about a month back where our veterans went to the streets uh, protesting to gain some privileges. That was, in my point of view, very fair. But we saw that it was not given the priority. It was not um, given the prominence that it should. And in fact, in my opinion, um, I think the only reason the government settled was because there was another presidential election coming. They, it was bad optics. So uh, that happened. We are spearheading right after the presidential election and we know that there are going to be some kind of a different take on our administrative uh, process in our country. What type of veteran service or uh, veteran system should we have to ensure that our veterans do not go back into the streets to fight for their demands? Uh, Mahesh, uh, we have certain agencies to look into uh, their grievances, but I don't think uh, this system, uh, that system is sufficient. Because as a res result of the 30 years uh, war, uh, we, we have lost about 30,000 men. So their families had to be looked after. Then uh, thousands of them, they have lost their limbs and some of them are paralyzed. Uh, so they can't get about uh, with their day-to-day uh, -day work. That need to be looked into. So you are talking about a huge uh, number. Uh, and especially uh, now it has come to a point, all these uh, uh, people, now they have got married or their children have grown up now. So now they are facing problems in the society. So this is the time. And people who are injured with the age, they have become more weaker, they have become more dependent. So this is the time we need to address. Actually, we need to have a proper organization to look into uh, these veterans and their uh, affairs of their families. Uh, we should not, they have done, a, they, are after a, uh, do, they are after doing a sacred service to this country. Indeed. Right? Sacred service. So, so we should not wait uh, till they come and stage protest and ask for things. We need to identify and have a proper system to address their grievances. I think uh, uh, Lieutenant, uh, I think uh, Gotabe Rajapaksa, a candidate, he will, he has told that he, he is a person who will understand these needs very well because up to the time of uh, he had to leave the, this thing, he had done everything possible, right? So there are uh, newly cropped up problems during these three, four years because of mm -hmm. the reason that I told you. So I think I'm sure that if he, when he becomes the president, he will address this issue very effectively. Indeed, uh, Major General uh, Sumedha Pereira, thank you very much for coming on the program and actually having a discussion, a very uh, eye-opening discussion, I would say, uh, with regard to um, Mr. Gora Rajpaksa himself. Uh, we actually learned something new uh, during his military career. And uh, more so, I thank you personally for your service for this country and thank you very much for what you have done. And uh, more so, thank you very much for coming on this program and sharing your thoughts and views. Um, Right after this, uh, I will be back on the other side with my closing arguments. The final moment has dawned upon us. This is a fight for our nation. This is a fight for our future. So much of sinister forces are at play right now in order to divert your attention from what's important at hand. What is important is that we have a country to call it our home. A country that we can be proud of. A country that would eventually be a pinnacle of yours and mine success. A country we all call our dear home. It's indeed sad to see how elements claiming to care for this country are only harboring people who were attached to perpetrators of the Easter attacks. They're on the stage when talking about national security and the worst parties, people still cheer for them. 
What's more important is that whoever's version you believe or whoever's vision you believe, you need to go to the polls and cast your vote. That is the only way. If you are supporting Gotabaya Rajapaksa, don't be fooled by the campaigns that are running around saying that it is a done deal for him. It will only be a done deal when you go and cast your vote. And if you are supporting Sajid Premadasa, then you need to fight for your candidate too by casting your vote. That is the only way. Now, on a programming note, the powerhouse team of Other Than 24 will join you on election night to dissect, analyze, and give you the results hot off the oven as and when it comes through. There's no place. I'm guaranteeing you there is no place else where you'd rather be other than right here on Other Than 24, TV Than or FM Than or Other Than LK. Join us for that. The election night live begins on a Saturday, the 16th of November from 6.55 p.m. onwards. Don't miss it. The time has finally come. Shota Bear Rajapaksa, Sajit Premadasa, who will be your next president. On election night, this is where Sri Lanka turns for answers. The powerhouse team of Other Than 24. Providing you with an unrivaled coverage with world-class standards that will be an experience. This is a place to be on election night. Other Verana Election Night Live, only on Sri Lanka's election network. I am Mahesh Johnny from all of us here at Other Verana 24 and the Real team. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next week. Make sure you vote. Good night.